good, good afternoon or evening or whatever it may be for wherever you folks are gathered. Uh, thanks very much for having me for this um, Kepner Trigo, Kepner Trigo, Trigo get-together. And uh, I have to say I'm a lifelong Kepner Trigo fan. In fact, I used to be uh, a board member for a few years back in my youth before I hit the mandatory retirement age of 70. But uh, Kepner Trigo is one of the, the experience I had being trained in the Kepner Trigo problem solving method when I was a uh, new hire at General Motors, they put all the new uh, hires, whether you had a, a bachelor's or an MBA, it didn't matter. You went to the Kepner Trigo course, which was one week long and I found it fascinating because uh, it was this uh, systematic approach to problem solving where you basically ask the question, what changed? And there were a number of uh, textbook cases, which uh, I was able to solve, at, at least as well as everybody else. And uh, I found it extremely useful in my later automotive career, because I found that just like they taught us at, in the Kepner Trigo course, when a problem comes up, most people jump to conclusions and they try an immediate fix. And then usually uh, the fix very often generates more problems. Whereas if you step back, look at the process, look at the various components and ask yourself what in this system, whether it's materials or work process or assembly, what changed? And that will usually identify uh, the root cause. I remember one uh, episode early in my career with General Motors at Automobilage in Germany, we were coming out with the Cadet B, which was a Cadet was a, a subcompact front engine, rear wheel drive. And it was the, the B model was essentially technologically similar to the A model. It used the same basic architecture and the same engine, same gearbox, but it went from a leaf spring rear suspension, which was quite harsh, to a coil spring rear suspension. Well, the early builds out of the factory in Rüsselsheim, which were put through production vehicle engineering tests, all failed their transmissions within about 500 miles on the test track. This is a manual transmission. The synchronizer rings gave out. And we, you know, engineering couldn't figure it out. And uh, though they would put the new drivetrain, which had been upped from one liter to 1.1 liter, uh, they first there was a theory, well, the added torque is failing the, the synchro rings. So they put the, which they'd done numerous times during early engineering testing, the new drivetrain with the bigger engine in the old car didn't fail. And they put the existing powertrain or drivetrain from the Cadet A into the Cadet B, and it did fail. Uh, it was always the synchronizer rings. And they were into massive re-engineering of the synchronizer rings, changing the chamfer angles, specifying new materials, and throwing all kinds of transmission technology at the problem. But nobody ever answered the properly answered the question, well, if we take the new transmission and engine and put it in the old car, why doesn't it fail? So I said, well, guys, let's sit down. And I was very junior at the time. My title was assistant to the managing director. In fact, I was assistant to the assistant to the managing director. So I was in one of the engineering meetings and I said, what, well, what exactly is different between the Cadet B and the Cadet A? And they said, well, we put in a, basically a coil spring rear suspension, which has more suspension travel. So we looked at a side elevation of the chassis and it was obvious that that one piece drive shaft, which had a circular spline to permit uh, angular movement, 
at the back of the transmission. With the old suspension, the suspension travel was such that it always stayed within the limits of the curved splines. But with the new suspension, when they went over bumps, it would get to the end of the splines and the transmission would momentarily bind. And when then when you shifted, you were basically forcing the synchronizer rings to shift through a blocked transmission and it was failing the synchronizer rings. So here I am, you know, not quite 30 years old or maybe 31 years old, no engineering degree. And I'm telling all these German engineers, here's what your problem is. And, uh, it met with uh, disbelief, but they said, what the hell, we'll try it. And they increased the amount of machining on that I would say lemon-shaped spline, added a few more millimeters of spline length on one end and a few more millimeters of spline length on the other. And sure enough, problem solved. So I think uh, that was clearly based purely on what I had learned, the methodology I'd learned at Kepner Trigo. And I, I ran into one, a similar one at Chrysler where uh, we were having uh, one, a routine quality meeting and one of the quality issues was that uh, the sun visors, which were uh, a plastic dielectric welded plastic pad with padding inside, but basically the, the outside was like a, you know, interior colored vinyl. Well, these were splitting open in the field and the stuffing was visible and they had to be replaced and it was a, a, an annoying wordy item. So what they wanted from me in the quality meeting was $2 million of investment to buy cut and sew tools because it was obvious that the dielectric welding was not reliable. It was opening up after a while and uh, we had to go to cut and sew which meant an investment. It was much more labor intensive. I mean, the reason you go to dielectric welding is because it eliminates cut and sew. So I asked the question, well, you know, the Kepner Trigo question, how long have we been making these sun visors in the Jeep Cherokee? Oh, uh, since 1984. How many millions have we built? Oh, probably two and a half, three million. When did they start splitting open? A few months ago. Well, why didn't the first two million fail? And that's only the recent ones that are opening up. Uh, we can't explain that, but all we know is we have to go to cut and sew. I said, no, you don't. I'll bet you what's happened is after that tool that dielectrically clamps the two pieces of vinyl for the weld, that tool probably has wear and it no longer has the clamping force it needs. So why don't you go check that before we uh, make the investment in the engineering effort for an all new solution. And they said, hmm. And it turned out, went to the supplier. Sure enough, that clamping and welding tool was worn. They built up the edge, machined it down again and the problem was solved for next to nothing. So and those are just two of the examples that are top of mind, but I can tell you that the Kepner Trigo methodology, and Kepner Trigo teachings uh, were vital and vital, a vital part of my career and helped me immeasurably and helped me indirectly teach others to look for the root cause by following the Kepner Trigo methodology. So I'm, I've said it before, I've, I've stated it in my books and in speeches. Um, I'm grateful to Kepner Trigo for the contribution it made to my career. And I believe the Kepner Trigo training is a valid experience for anyone who is in any sort of leadership position. So thanks very much and have a great meeting.